My name is Lynn Caldwell. I, my biggest claim to fame is that your pastor, Mike Colley, is my eldest nephew. I'm in town. I just drove out from uh, Southern California. As it turns out, it's a long drive. Not planning to do that again anytime soon. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm on a little bit of a vacation time and some time to do some other work on some projects. And I'm so glad to spend a few minutes with you this morning. Can I tell you before I start, um, when I knew that my nephew was a person, I'm not sure if you agree with me on this or not, but my opinion, when I realized that my nephew was going to grow up to be a wise and a smart and amazing young man, the moment I knew that, was when he introduced me to Ashley Martin. When he in college said to me, that's right, give it up for the big A. When he, when he, when I was living in Maryland, I was working at the general conference, and uh, he said, I'm bringing my girlfriend home, and they were in Pennsylvania at that time, and he said, uh, I want to bring her down to your house and so we can take her into Washington, D.C. I said, okay, I'm meeting the girlfriend for the first time. And I started imagining what she would be like. And it got frightening in my head immediately. <laughs> and then the luckiest people, the blessed, most blessed family in the world, when she showed up, I said, my nephew is a great man. Because he picked an amazing, God blessed us with an amazing woman. So I'm so thankful for that. So thankful. Um, I know I don't know uh, you folks very well, so I'll just let you know. Um, I teach at La Sierra University in Riverside, California. I've been with them for three years. Before that, uh, I was uh, in graduate school at Virginia Tech, working at the graduate school at Virginia Tech. Before that, I taught at Southern Adventist University. Before that, I also taught at Andrews. I've, I've spent a lot of time, and most of my career has been in the classroom. Uh, now when I look at my retirement account, I, I tend to regret that. <laughs> but, but I'm so thankful for the 31 years of uh, time in service. Uh, and the wonderful young people, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about them this morning. Uh, this morning, uh, as we start, um, we start with Scripture, Mark, Mark 1, chapters 1 through 42. Mark 1, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 through 42 says this, and a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can heal me. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man. I'm willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. Let's pray one more time. Heavenly Father, Thank you that we have the chance to be together here as a community. Heavenly Father, I know that I need healing. Maybe some other people need healing as well this morning. Uh, and Lord, I concern myself uh, as a very imperfect person. Uh, I concern myself that I'm here and I'm speaking on your behalf. I pray to be your vessel. I pray that there will be something here that will be of value and goodness to others. And I thank you. Amen. This text in Mark 1, amazingly, has always been my favorite text. And I'm not sure exactly why. I do think that uh, there are two basic reasons. Number one, this text gives us an insight into Jesus. It's uh, really a... Um, very raw, stripped-down moment of just one little interaction, right? And then his reaction back. Somebody came to him on his knees in sincerity and said, I believe that if you are willing, you can make me whole. You can heal me. And that moment, I love it, that moment, filled with compassion, Christ recognized the sincerity 
And he said, I am willing. Be healed. That moment is a beautiful story. And it's one of my favorites. Someone received healing. Uh, someone connected to the compassion of Christ. And somebody received a second chance. And so my purpose for just the next few minutes is to dissect this story with you and to just draw out of it whatever we can so that we can chase our own healing. And I know, I, I have been in worship with you before. I know you folks are, are very strong and fine Christian people of faith. And I admire that so much because I find myself going... Um, uh, I find myself, the older I get, struggling in new areas in my faith. I don't know if you do as well. I look at other people and I think, oh, they're so much stronger than I am. Um, they're, they've got their act together so much more than I do. Um, and uh, I find different areas in my life that need and require healing, uh, spiritually and otherwise. So let's uh, dig into that a little bit this morning. Um, one of the first major lessons that I pull from this story is the whole concept of the coming. Uh, this man coming to Christ and seeking that healing. I think that's a really important point that we have a tendency maybe uh, to overlook. We assume that everyone who needs healing will come, will take some sort of action. But we all know that's not true, right? Many times, and I know in myself too, many times when I've needed something, I haven't chosen to reach out and to ask. I haven't chosen to go and to pursue. And I think that is one of the first lessons we can uh, learn from this anonymous man in Scripture that we only know as the leper. And think about the destitute and desperate place that he was in. He was, of course, as we know, he was a cultural outcast because of his disease. He was considered a sinner because of his disease. He was dying. He was desperate. And he still had the presence of mind to have that glimmer of hope and faith. And he still, despite the barriers, decided to come. And I think that is a, a huge um, point. Um, I gave this talk actually about a year ago for the first time. Uh, I prepared this originally as a chapel talk to my students at La Sierra University. Um, uh, we have about 2,500 students. We're, we're growing very quickly out there. And um, I, it's the most unique place I've ever taught at. And I had to stop in my talk at this point and say to these students, that day in our chapel, maybe you are not a person of faith. Maybe you have never come to a place in your life where you need and require faith, Christianity, or you have seriously considered Christ. I don't have to stop and do that with you today, I'm guessing. Um, with, the, with our kids, I do. And I'd like to take just a moment and, um, and tell you a little bit about our students. Um, in Southern California, particularly, there are tons and tons of people who are reaching to get uh, a degree, higher education. They are reaching. Um, and the community colleges are busting at the seams. Some people have to wait two years on a waiting list to get into classes. So here is little La Sierra University in the midst of this. And all of a sudden, as the population grows and people can't get into other schools and they're on huge waiting lists, uh, all kinds of people from all walks of life <laughs> kind of wind up plopped right at the gate of La Sierra University. So about 40, 45% of our students now come, uh, they don't come out of the Adventist faith. Uh, the second largest Advent, uh, the second largest faith group on our campus are Catholics. Uh, we have uh, Muslims on our campus. We have people who are not people of faith. 
They're seeking a good quality undergraduate education and we are available to them. And uh, uh, for a lot of good Catholic families, they will not send their children, especially their daughters, to large state schools. We are safe. We are faith-based. And we wind up with those kids. So for many reasons, we wind up with people from all walks of life on our campus. So when we talk about faith and we talk about Christ and that concept of do you require, do you feel the need for healing? Do you feel the need to come for healing? Um, we have to begin further back in the discussion. This is who you're coming to. This is who you can come to. And that's who our kids are. And I'll, I'll offer you just one small little example of that. Um, and I think this story is really important because uh, because of this population shift and because these people have embraced us and come to do their college degree with us, um, they walk in and know very little about faith and very little about God. And so they wind up on a learning journey uh, that is much deeper than just going to classes. Uh, and an example I can offer you is I had a, a young woman in her early 30s in all my classes very smart young woman, tall, uh, an athlete, still in her early 30s, an athletic, very athletic runner. And so uh, one day in class, we were talking about uh, culture and certain things that are unacceptable in culture or, you know, activities people frown on. And she goes, I'm involved in one of those activities, she said right out loud in class. And I was just like, okay, wanting to be supportive. Please don't tell me. And she did. Uh, and uh, actually, she came to my office and talked with me. And this girl was incredibly bright. Um, and I wasn't sure what she was going to tell me, but she said, you know, I'd like to sit down and talk with you. Okay, let's talk. And she said, you know, um, I'm an exotic dancer. I'm like, really? And she says, you probably know. I said, no, I know nothing. So don't assume I know anything because I do not. It was, I have never had an experience like that. And um, she has considered faith. She graduated not long ago, with a great GPA. And she had moved on with her life, marriage. She already had a little boy, making sure that he was raised well. And um, her, uh, part of her learning journey was the consideration of faith. The idea for the first time in her life that there was a higher power that I could go to. And when she first started school with us, she was still dancing uh, for a living. And um, she told me as the couple of quarters went past, she said, you know, I've quit dancing. And I said, really? I said, is that, uh, I mean, how are you feeling about that? She goes, uh, I feel good about it. She said, uh, I hadn't been back in months. I found other ways of making money that I'm more comfortable with. And um, uh, she said, you know, the other day I decided to go back and for an another couple of nights. And she said, as soon as I walked in, I just felt so strongly. It's like a voice inside me saying, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And she said, I turned around and I left. And she said, that part of my life is over. And uh, I'm ready to move on. And that young woman never graduated. When she graduated, I can't say to you that she was a baptized member of the Adventist church. Um, uh, and I'm not sure where she was on her spiritual journey. But I saw a young woman take... Uh, a very thoughtful, personal, spiritual trip. And she stopped and she pondered. And every time we start class, well, in my classes, we pray before we start. And when I ask them to pray, the kids who are not people of faith sometimes 
just stare straight ahead. They don't, they're not sure what to do. This young woman, with great reverence, always bowed her head. And she knows that we will always be there for her spiritually and to help her in, in her career. So uh, when I prepared this talk, these are the people that uh, I was thinking about who walks into our chapel and says, what is this all about? We are serving not only the Adventist young person, but this young person and saying, you can come. Is there something that you feel the need for healing from? This is available to you. You can come. And like the leper and like this young woman, we all have opportunity to come um, and to act on what we need. Um, and I think the action of coming is very psychological, psychologically significant because when we come to Christ and we ask for healing, we are um, recognizing that there's an issue that we would like to fix. Uh, we are feeling pain that we would like to recognize. Um, we would like to examine our past a little bit more. We feel weak where we would like to add strength. Um, maybe we regret stupid mistakes or we admit being overwhelmed. There are so many reasons to come. Um, one reason that I offered my students um, and that I would offer you as well um, is... Uh, I know for myself, I see character flaws in, in myself that I seem to be perpetually hanging on to. In other words, I thought, oh, well, by the time I get a certain age, I will have, that's, that would be all done. No, no. Apparently, those hang on with you for a long, long time. And one example I can offer you is that uh, I enjoy disliking people. And I think this might actually come. I've always said, you know, I'm a uh, born and raised Southerner. Uh, I'm a redneck who wound up going to school and getting an education and got kind of plopped into the classroom. And it's like, well, I'll be darned. How about that? You know, I um, didn't really anticipate uh, going into uh, an academic lifestyle. Uh, and I still have that, I almost call it... Uh, that southern fire in my belly. You want to fight? Yeah. Draw that line in the sand. Yeehaw. You know, I am my father's daughter. And um, when I think about the many things that I need to come to Christ for and ask for healing, um, uh, one example that I might feel comfortable in offering you is the fact that um, man, I'll hold a grudge forever. That the, the text in the Bible about forgiveness has always vexed me terribly. I need more time with Christ to say, you know what? I need you to help me figure out how to forgive. I need you to help me figure out how to, um, uh, how not to be so happy when bad things happen to people I don't like. High five myself. <laughs> Look at that. You know, there are so many things that in my life I'm too busy to come. I, and I embrace it because it's funny. I think it's funny when I make jokes about people I don't like. I think it's funny when I, I laugh when bad things happen to them. Uh, I've got to learn to let go and to love more like Christ. Um, and there are so many things like that, things that maybe um, are not so serious or things that are really deeply serious. Um, uh, making sure that we are reconciled to all of our relationships. I can tell you another one of my students uh, I had at Southern actually this young man was a drug dealer in Baltimore who purchased a Bible because he wanted to understand God. With his money he made from drug dealing, he went to the store and purchased a Bible because he said he wanted to understand God. Through that, he read about the Sabbath. He became a Seventh-day Adventist. 
because one of the guys he used to sell drugs with had a relative who was an Adventist. And he wound and he liked potlucks. And he wound up at the Adventist church, was baptized, changed his life, and wound up in college at Southern Adventist University. And this little kid, when he first got to us, still looked like, well, if you can, this is a stereotype. It's like, oh, look at the drug dealer on the front row of my classroom, you know. And he was just, he was a street kid. And so when he smiled, this was him smiling. <laughs> you know, he was frightening. What a heart. What a life. Great grades. Pulled himself together. By the time he was in fifth grade, he was living on the streets in Baltimore. This young man this young man came to Christ and he asked sincerely. He asked sincerely for healing. And he received it. And he changed his life and became a whole new person. And he had a lot to overcome. And I remember him in my office one day in tears. And he said, you know, it costs a lot to be in school here. And he said, I used to make a lot of money selling drugs. I could sell drugs and pay for my Christian education. And I was like, don't do that. I don't think that's good. But, you know, in his mind, he was like, in faith, I am here. And in faith, I have changed my life. And in faith, my economic circumstances are in God's hands because they've completely changed. He came and he asked. We must choose to ask. And I think by asking, we are taking a step of friendship toward Christ, are we not? Because when we, um, when we are in relationship with someone and we feel comfortable with them, we feel like we can go to them and ask. You're my friend, and I'm, I'm coming to you, and I'm asking for your help and your assistance. And that's a beautiful part of friendship as well, and a beautiful part of being with, um, uh, being in friendship with Christ. One of the last things I'd like to point out about the uh, story of the leper is that uh, in the story, he received. Now, uh, it's a great story, and it's beautiful, but we have to connect to the reality of it. In the story he received, I can tell you flat out that the reality check that I have for you is that I have prayed, and I have come, and I have asked, and I feel like I have not received. How about you? We've all been there, I bet, right? We come and we ask, and we haven't received. And so we stood by the loved one who passed away. I remember when my mom died. I remember praying for healing that didn't come. Eventually, we're all there. Um, the man or the woman that you have loved left or was unacceptable, and it didn't work, and you don't know what to do with that. Maybe that's an unanswered prayer. The money that you need did or did not show up, right? Uh, the protection that you needed did or did not show up. Uh, the opportunity that you had hoped for and prayed for was lost. Uh, the list can be endless of not receiving. And I can offer you just a brief example of myself. As a graduate student at Virginia Tech, I would have never left the borders of Virginia. Never. Talk about being happily ensconced in Appalachia for the rest of your life. That's my place. And somehow, in the weird mix of things, I wind up in Southern California where everything is beige and brown and there are no trees. They call bushes trees in, in Southern California. Um, this, thank you. You feel my pain? Um, this is not an answer to prayer for me. I did not want this. I cried. And I'm not a crier, as I've said. I'm a get evener. I am not a crier. I cried when I realized that I was going to California. You know? 
But that unanswered prayer answered another prayer for me, I can say, which was I have always wanted to, to work at a school that works with a diverse population <coughs> of young people who come from all walks of life, who are reaching up out of poverty. A lot of our kids are doing that. Um, and, are, and they are reaching out of families who have never had the chance, their parents or no one ever had the chance to go to college. These are the kids I've always wanted to work with and minister to. Um, and I, I, that prayer has been answered. I didn't want it to happen in Southern California. But that prayer was answered for me. So, you know, uh, the leper received, we may not receive. Uh, we may receive something completely different. We may have forgotten what we had asked for before that we received because we just asked for something else that we didn't receive. But I do believe this. Uh, I believe that we are all, always listened to and that... Uh, we are listened to with great compassion and that we do receive in some way. We receive uh, in God's infinite wisdom what he may have for us at that time. Um, I believe that we must seek out our healing. And uh, I also believe, and this is important that I pointed this out to my students, and I think it's important for everyone, is that uh, there's lots of qualified people in this world who can help us pursue healing. Is there not? And we pray and we ask God for healing. And I uh, am happy to pray with anyone and any of my students every day for whatever they feel they need. Uh, but also, we have to reach out to the people who can help us with that. We have wonderful pastors at La Sierra to help our kids. We have a wonderful counseling staff. Uh, so we have work to do as well in the process of our own healing. Um, in closing, um, I'd like to tell you, about just one more of my students that I met since I've been at uh, La Sierra, a young woman from Northern California who was in my speech class. I teach public speaking. And you're probably thinking, hmm, yes, it's true. <laughs> this is a little more informal than what we teach uh, in class. But um, this young woman was dynamite. I mean, smart beautiful young woman. When she got up front, she owned that room. And this is an 18, 18, 19 year old. I mean, she was unafraid. She was powerful. This young woman has a real future in anything she chooses to do. And she, again, one of those situations, she comes, she sits down in the office, we chat for a while. And she shows, she has a tattoo. A lot of my kids have tattoos. I've learned a lot about tattoos since I've moved to California. Apparently, it's a big thing in California. You're thinking, Lynn, have you gotten a tattoo? No, I haven't gotten a tattoo, but thank you for asking. <laughs> no. But she has a tattoo on her wrist. And at La Sierra, because our population is very diverse, we are, try to be very cautious about what we ask, you know, we don't want to, I mean, I, I don't want to be overly um, inquisitive to the point that they think that I'm being judgmental of them. Uh, it's about loving them, accepting them, and walking with them. And this young woman has a tattoo on her wrist. And I did not ask. And she told me, she said, you know, when I was in high school, I fell into a deep depression and I started cutting and I was starting to cut my wrists. And she said, through a lot of help, a help from professionals, and she said, and faith in Christ, that part of my life is over. And she said, I came to college and things are great. And she says, I never want to forget that time. And I never want to forget 
that God went on this journey with me. And God provided me healing. And so she has a tattoo right here. And what it says is God is greater than the highs and lows. And she tattooed that over her scars. God is greater than the highs and lows. And her story was well known around campus. And actually, someone decided to take a copy of that and to put it on a sticker. And now at our campus, you will see kids walking around with their book bags and their backpacks. And that sticker with her message is on their backpack. God is greater than the highs and lows. And that's a beautiful message. So as we, you know, as I conclude with you, um, the story of the leper, uh, he came, he asked, God says, ask and you will receive. We know that from Matthew. Uh, and he received. And, and so if we were to paraphrase that text again uh, today for ourselves, it might read something like, in a man and a woman who live in Franklin, Tennessee, who go to a little church in Franklin, came to Christ and begged on their knees, if you're willing, you can heal me, you can make me whole. Always filled with compassion, Jesus reaches out his hand and he touches us all. And he says, I am willing. Be whole. God bless you.